Hey yo. What's up everybody? We all are back for another MLOps community meetup. I as always am stoked to be here, but I am very excited this time because we have the most incredible guest for you today. Not that we ever do not have incredible guests, but today we're going to be talking with Raul. And as always, I'm going to bring him on to the stage with a little musical melody introducing him. And then I'm going to do a few housekeeping items before we actually hear from Raul. But, you know, let's just uh, let's rock it a little bit. Here we go. Anybody got a key that you want me to play in? Throw it in the chat right now. If you have a specific key that you like to hear guitar being played in, tell me in the chat because we're about to get a little Raul in our life. Get a little Raul here tonight. Raul, I'm not even going to try and pronounce your last name. Here we go. Yeah, so Raul has 13 years of experience building AI solutions and leading teams. He's passionate about building artificial intelligence. Solutions for improving the human experience. He's currently the founder of AI Hero, a platform to help you fix and enrich your data with ML at AI Hero. He's been, he's been, he's been using Kubernetes for so long. He's a big proponent of declarative MLOps. Using Kubernetes to operationalize the training and serving life cycles of your machine learning models. He's published several tutorials on medium and we're gonna start with the meetup now i'll stop boring you with this intro song raul where you at welcome to the show this is incredible. I, I love, I woke up today morning and I said that somebody's going to serenade me and, and this is phenomenal. Dude, you had the premonition, huh? You knew it was good. I mean, you didn't say what the quality of that serenade was going to be, but at least yeah. the serenade nap. So, Chad GPT has no shit on you. <laughs> Speaking of Chad GPT, dude, I got to say this before you get started. I went ahead and created some shirts in case anybody wants to check them out because tomorrow we have the LLMs in production conference that's happening. Hopefully everyone that is here joining us right now already knows about it and has already signed up. If not, I'll drop a link to it in the chat and just have a look, man. What do you think about that shirt right there? This I don't know if you can see what is going on here, but... I want. I just want to show you what that says. It says I hallucinate more than Chat GPT. Can you see that there? Can you see that? I love it. Let's get it maybe a little bit bigger so that you can see it. 
Oh, 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 there it is. There it is. So I'll drop a link to that in the chat in case anyone wants to get this shirt. We're going to be giving it out as swag for free tomorrow for some of the most active and best participants of the event. And without further ado, dude, I think it's time that I hand this over to you. I'm super excited for tomorrow's event, by the way. All the lineup of speakers are super exciting. And um, LLMs have have uh, changed the way we are thinking about AI and we're thinking about uh, how, how our industry is moving forward and yeah. excited to hear and learn from all the best. And there will be more bad musical <laughs> interludes. So, you know, can guarantee you'll have fun at least. <laughs> for sure. All right, dude, I'm going to throw your slides up on the screen and I'll let you get started. All right. Awesome. Uh, and I'm going to focus only on the slides. So let me know if there's, I'm missing anything on any other screen. But good morning, good afternoon, good evening, where are you, wherever you folks are. Uh, my name is Rahul. I'm a founder of AI Hero. And uh, today I want to be talking about declarative MLOps and how do you streamline model serving on Kubernetes. This is a fresh slide deck um, and uh, includes all my uh, learnings and best practices about building, containerizing, and deploying machine learning models on Kubernetes. So um, please bear with me. There's a lot of things that I would really wanted to share with the community uh, because I have been learning a lot from the community and wanted to give back. Awesome. So let's get started with the number one question. What is declarative MLOps, right? So the declarative part of the title refers to this declarative paradigm, which is you define what needs to be accomplished without defining how it needs to get done. And that is essentially the way Kubernetes works. So all of you are aware, you know, Kubernetes is this platform which allows you to orchestrate your uh, workloads, be it jobs, servers, um, databases, and so on. And what, the way it starts is, at least on the MLOps side, um, an ML engineer comes and she says, um, this is the target layout of my app. Uh, my model server uh, needs to be deployed with two replicas. So there'll be two instances running uh, the model. And uh, I also need, by the way, a backend server with one replica. And she points out to what these files are, uh, where, where what the container images are in these YAML files. The moment she applies them to Kubernetes uh, using the Kubernetes API, it's stored in uh, EDCD, and the Kubernetes control plane um, either works with the cloud provider that you're on, or the control manager starts scheduling, uh, working with the scheduler to schedule these servers inside pods on actual virtual machines or nodes. Each node would have some sort of a container orchestration system as well, and a networking interface. And Kubernetes layer is taking care of all of this orchestration and serving up the models. And so at the end, your users will get access to these uh, backends and model servers and any other ser services you have. And that's what the declarative paradigm is, which is define what you want uh, and the system takes care of it. And I think we can do a lot uh, with this paradigm with MLOps. So the question is why now? Why why is this a good time to get uh, into declarative MLOps? And I just wanted to sh share this uh, very interesting uh, uh, hype cycle. So all of you guys may have read about the uh, Gartner hype cycle, which starts with this technology trigger. There is a peak of inflated expectations, trough of disillusionment, slope of enlightenment, and plateau of uh, productivity. I'm sorry, the slide doesn't read correctly, um, but. Let's see LLMs, right? LLMs is over here right now, which is everybody is trying things out. And this is a natural way of looking at problems uh, or looking at technology. And we're at the stop. But Kubernetes has passed all of this and now slowly rising the slope of enlightenment, which makes it a good, uh, which makes it more uh, accessible and more adopted in the industry. Uh, Kubernetes is also great for scalability. So this is a screenshot of uh, OpenAI's web uh, uh, blog from OpenAI. This dates back a couple of years, so this is obviously not the latest uh, what they're doing. Um, but you can see that the best uh, companies are using internally Kubernetes to scale their training and uh, serving workloads to thousands of nodes. Uh, and scalability makes Kubernetes very attractive to, 
to, to launch our workflows. Um, this slide is, or at least the image is borrowed from the amazing work uh, on the ML, AI, and data landscape um, from Forcepark Capital. Um, and it doesn't include all the ML ops tools out there, but what I did my best was to go through each of these websites and see if they are if they are either native on Kubernetes or provide supports to it. Almost all of them provide support for Kubernetes, but the ones underlined have some sort of an implementation or way that you can use it on Kubernetes. So if you if you recognize any of these names, you'll know that um, these tools are very um, they like Kubernetes as well. So you're not in a bad place if you start with Kubernetes. Um, there is this this list le leaves out a lot of different tools. So if you have uh, more interest, there's you can Google for this uh, awesome MLOps uh, Git repo, which has a link to uh, more tools. Awesome Kubernetes. Um, the declarative paradigm also makes it possible for tool vendors or frameworks to provide you with easier ways to deploy a model. So these are two uh, tools that I love a lot. One is Bento ML, whose Yatai uh, release recently allows you to declare what that particular classifier needs to be deployed as. So here you can see it's an IRIS classifier. Um, it is it has some CPU uh, requirements, and there's also some auto scaling uh, that that Bento ML is doing. KServe um, also is a great tool for you to deploy your inferencing models and so on. So uh, you can you can point the the Triton server or K serving container to uh, the location of your model. Uh, and there's some predictor here as well. So amazing tools um, help you with the declarative model, uh, deploy machine learning models to Kubernetes really easily. But there are some caveats, and right? there were stars all on those previous slides. So let's, let's just talk about this, right? Kubernetes may or may not be the right solution for you, depending on the size. And uh, so let's, let's look at these lists. So first of all is scalability. Uh, Obviously, as I mentioned, um, Kubernetes scales really easily and cloud vendors provide you tools with that, but management complexity increases with this scale and you have to deal with balancing costs with the servers. Um, with tools, amazing tools like Bento ML, KServe exist, you need to figure out whether you want to build uh, your own thing versus buy or license some of these tools. These Tool providers also have some managed services which you can use and get started easily. Uh, and that's, you know, you need to um, check whether that is, uh, you can do that within your cluster or not. Uh, tool provided CRDs are great to get started, but my personal experience is sometimes they get hard to debug. So if you have an uh, MLOps tool that uh, has an amazing community, I would lean towards picking that. Uh, one problem that uh, I faced when deploying models with tool provider CRDs was in an air-gapped environment, which basically means that that environment has no connection to the internet. Um, the support system for doing that is not yet developed for Kubernetes. So one of those reasons why I decided to build my own container was 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 something like this. Um, and lastly, and this often get overlooked when you're talking about technology, but it's the people are using technology. And so look at your team. It takes a few months for your team to get comfortable with Kubernetes. and sometimes your organization might not be ready for your Kubernetes. So with these caveats, I still feel that Kubernetes and machine learning ops on Kubernetes is, is the way to go. Um, so this talk is gonna be talking about or covering three things. One is we're gonna talk about three ways to serve your model. We're going to talk about how do you build your own container and native Kubernetes operators for model serving. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about how do you increase your deployment uh, or model deployment velocity with uh, CI/CD best practices like GitOps. Awesome. So let's talk first about three ways to uh, serve your machine learning models. The first one is to serve a model as an HTTP endpoint. And this is what, what you see most common with even the tool vendors out there, right? Which is you, you containerize the model in a server which is powered by an HTTP endpoint, either with Flask or Fast API, really good options there. Um, the, the way I think about serving these models with serv servers is uh, HTTP endpoints is if you're if the user is performing an action which is leading to a prediction and then the user is waiting for the response back, this is a perfect place for you to insert that model in an, as an HTTP endpoint. Mm -hmm. Response time, 500 milliseconds is still very, very generous. You'd probably want something in the 
in the hundreds, uh, in the lower hundreds of milliseconds or even in tens of milliseconds, uh, as much as your network will allow. The second way to serve the model is with a message queue. So if the user action or a backend process, like let's say a file upload, uh, which is an event source, uh, triggers the model prediction and there's no UI waiting for the response, uh, message queue, uh, a model working behind a message queue would be a great option. And so there's a model service which reads from the request queue and pushes its predictions either into a database which stores those predictions or um, you know triggers another, other, another event. Um, that's a great place for you to serve the model as a message queue. And lastly, um, the third way is long-running tasks that performs batch processing. So think about your nightly runs and the pr pr uh, predicting on a large amount of data where there's absolutely no user waiting for um, waiting for response. Uh, you can use something like batch prediction on on uh, uh, using this third way, which is a long-running task. So let's compare some. Let's compare these and see what options you have in, in, in each of these, right? Um, in the HTTP endpoint, if you want to really build your own um, container and uh, service for this, uh, Flask, FastAPI are great options. In fact, FastAPI is going to give a talk uh, tomorrow in real life, uh, in the SF in real life event uh, meetup for the MLOps community. I personally am uh, using Falcon recently. Falcon 3.0 and onwards is super fast and I prefer that, but each of these has some uh, advantages that you should consider, um, which is fronted by Nginx and uh, Gunicorn, which helps you uh, make the model really stable. On the Kubernetes side, you can deploy this with primitives such as deployments and service, which we'll, which we'll cover in a bit. But there are all obviously great alternatives, Kser, Bento ML, Seldon, all amazing tools. Uh, or you could do something with native uh, or Knative, however you want to pronounce it. it it's a serverless deployment on top of Kubernetes. Um, with message queue, you can implement your own with Redis queues or Kafka or RabbitMQ or pick a message queue that you want. Uh, if you need a very robust pipeline, I would highly recommend Kafka, but for the most part, just for triggers that are immediate Redis and, and that don't uh, go over the RAM limit that your models, uh, that your Redis has, Redis queues are a great option uh, to do things fast. Uh, the Kubernetes primitives uh, are just a deployment. You don't attach a service to it. There's no um, alternatives I know of in the tooling space which allow this. With batch processing, um, you can use uh, your regular Python program fronted with a PM2 or a process manager to do it. Um, the Kubernetes primitive would be a job, but you have some amazing tools, uh, workflow tools that you can actually use for batch processing like Metaflow, Flight, etc. Finally, on the inference graph, you'd probably be able to get away with the same uh, tooling as above, but you know, obviously, um, tools like KSERP have inference graph, or Selden has inference graphs, and, and and you can use that to 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 implement like more than one model together. Um, but I prefer build, build building my own containers, and this comes from my experience uh, with with the data annotation company I worked at, where we were serving about thirty six different models in production and with various modalities, right? So there was text, image, uh, audio, video processing, and so on. And as a director of data science at that organization, I needed to make sure that not just the technology selected was right, but the process itself was correct as well. And so if you have somebody new come in and, or a new model come in that was just released with this amazing pace of AI that we're seeing, you want to move fast. And so the uh, pros uh, of build, and build your own are there's a consistent strategy, um, is operationally optimized and works for all the three ways. Uh, with pros for the uh, containerizing with the third party or easy container options are they are optimized. So it's, some tools have micro batching that they allow, they scale down to zero. They have amazing um, advantages as well. So do look into it. The cons are most of them are HTTP endpoint only. Um, if there is something is not working, it becomes really hard to debug and you have to reach out to the actual authors of the open source project, which they have communities for. So um, you'd be... Uh, that you'd, you'd have some answers, but it might take some time. And lastly, uh, you know, the build layer on it is not as optimized as this, which is a con, but, um, you know, it, I still prefer it because it helps me deploy to air-gapped environments, and it's a standardized way for all three.
the next few slides, I'm going to actually go into code, but if we don't want to look at all the code, on the left-hand side, you'll see some guiding factors that we'll talk about how we are containerizing this model step-by-step. Uh, step. So the first thing you need is obviously your singleton or the class which will have the model. Um, and one way to do it uh, is have it as a singleton. You have a load method which will load the model once, but inside that met method, it will uh, warm up the model. So before anybody calls for prediction, you will load the model and warm it up. And the rest of the class looks like this, wherein you have a predict method which takes just the input and the output. There's no HTML here, it's just no JSON here, it's just Python objects, which would be given to the model um, to uh, predict, get the output, and return it back. Um, I'm adding some performance counters here for my benefit to, to just check how, how fast uh, these things are running. So that's the main class that has the model but you need to package it in different ways for all the three ways we talked about. So for the first way, there are a few steps. The first is you need a health check um, for your service, HTTP endpoint, which Kubernetes can hit and confirm that the model is running or cycle it out if not needed. And for that, you need a health check handler. Again, for this, uh, I'm just using Falcon because that's what I prefer these days. But uh, Flask and FastAPI are a great choice as well. And so in the health check, uh, you you warm up the model. Um, that's the first endpoint you need. The second endpoint you need is obviously a prediction one where you uh, have some additional logic to check if the inputs are correct or not. Um, do the prediction and then form your actual uh, JSON object that you want to return to the user. Um, and so this is kind of, uh, again, Falcon Falcon's way of just converting dictionaries to uh, JSON objects directly. So this is the second thing that you need to do. The third one is you need uh, an app.py which will connect these endpoints to the Falcon app. And that's basically what it has done. You have similar app.py with Flask if, you, if you've if you seen that code. Um, but that basically defines at what route are we serving what endpoint. Um, and in order to serve this behind, robustly serve this behind Nginx and Golcon, we'll use the WSGI connector, so this is a specification that just says, hey, this is where the app is located. Great, so the fourth thing you need is the Nginx config. So Nginx allows you to add extra uh, denial of service uh, prevention, gzipping, and additional benefits that help you uh, make sure that the model is not being misused, or at least put some security uh, restrictions on the model uh, based on it being open externally. Internally, or if you're using an external load balancer and external uh, denial of service service like Cloudflare or whatever it is, this might become less important, but I, I, I strongly recommend you do this because Gunukorn uh, recommends you do this as well. So you define that in the Nginx config that your Nginx server needs to dock to Gunukorn. Um, you tell it what is the port. Um, optional, you can provide some optimization like gzip, uh, path protection, and so on. And lastly, the actual serve script, which starts both the Nginx process, it starts the Gurkhan workers. You can define how many workers you want here, but I prefer just one and then scale up with the containers so that it's, it's more stable. Um, there's also, you need a way to handle SIG term events because if the Kubernetes uh, platform sends a SIG, SIG term event to the container, you want to stop all these services together. So that's way one. So with, with all of these five things in this, and I, I apologize that it looks complicated, uh, but when it all comes together, you get a very robust uh, server that can handle um, all the requests that can, and then you let Kubernetes orchestrators scale it up and down as needed. So for way two, which is a message queue, um, we do things a little differently. The first thing you need is obviously the script that is reading off the queue. So you connect to your Redis or whatever queue you want read the input topic and the output topic, load the model. Um, from the topic, which is some serialized uh, data, you will deserialize it. Here I'm loading it in JSON. You'll, you'll validate the input, you'll predict on it, and then send the prediction into, uh, into uh, the target or the prediction queue. So you're basically getting in messages about the requests for prediction from a queue, and you're passing the prediction request to Q in this example. So that's a simple way in which you write your Python program. But the second thing you need here is your start script. Um, I'm using uh, PM2 as a package manager here. I'm sorry, as a pro the, the process manager, which just spins up the workers. 
and make sure that if there is something that happens with the process and it fails, PM2 will start it back up and make sure that it's always running. So it just adds a layer of robustness in this uh, process. So that's the second thing you do inside uh, the container. For the third way, which is batch predict, you'll have another Python program uh, wherein you're getting the batch to the input and output files. And this can be on your S3 or some object store where you can download it inside the container, load the model, read from the files, and then either predict individually or as many batches. Obviously, you know, as predicting as batch uh, makes it faster. And then you write it to the output file and store that file back into the object store. Um, so that's the first thing you need to do, which is having this class that wraps our predictor. And then um, the second part you need is a, a script that starts this thing. So I'm just using Python here to start the process, but you can actually put this inside a shell script that you can call, call with a cron dab or cron job and say, this script needs to run midnight every night, and it will make sure that that happens. So those were three how you containerize your model uh, in three ways, but you need some additional uh, sanity checks. And so unit tests are a great way to test software and we'll just use the unit test package um, for testing our models as well. So with uh, we, we create a test wherein for some uh, zero shot prediction, like let's say this is just doing predicting whether this sentence is sad or happy. We, ass we assert whether the prediction is correct. We also assert some, um, make some assertions on the scores return just to make sure that the model, if the model version changes or if the underlying libraries change, the model is still good to go in production. So this is just a sanity check. This is not for your um, the test curves that you're doing for model training, uh, while, while model training or holdout data set. This is just making sure that from a product perspective, when you launch a model in, in serving, it, it passes all the checks. And to connect, bring it all together, in the container, you need an entry point script. Now this entry point script will uh, be a shell script, for example. It asks, it, it will pass it a command and the command will be either serve, test, start the message queue or batch process. So you can see that in just one container, I have uh, packaged the model in and serving it in all three ways. And depending on the command that you send it, uh, you can start it as a HTTP endpoint, a message queue or a batch process. And that, that uh, makes it very convenient because now you don't have to create different ways of serving for three different things. If somebody new joins your team, they are aware of how do you uh, containerize very, and they can learn quickly and repeat the process. So operationally, this is a very sound, uh, sound method. Every container has a Docker file, which explains, which has the instructions and how do you uh, create the container and think of it like installation instructions that you would do on a virtual machine. So. We start with a Python image or a TensorFlow image, whatever you want, uh, install the dependencies. For security, you should always run your container as a non-root user. So here you can see that we created the non-root user and uh, made sure it can own the Nginx and the, the folders that we will uh, load the models in. And we also uh, pip install all the requirements that our models need. The second part of this file is more interesting, wherein I prefer to download the model inside the container so that when the model server starts, it has the, uh, it, has the it has the model right there at a path. And so inside this build command for the Docker, you can see that I'm, for the zero shot classification, I am downloading using hub and paste uh, transformers library, the model itself. And I think that makes it uh, super fast because you don't have to load the model uh, at runtime. But obviously if your model is, let's say, tens of gigabytes, you might need to consider a different strategy. Um, I prefer to also add linting and MyPy to uh, my code because every check-in I make, we just ensure that there are no, uh, there's, there's enough uh, sanity check on the code itself that makes the model really good. And finally, you, uh, you mentioned what the entry point is and how to run it so that when we run the serve command or when we run the start message queue command, it knows where to find it. A lot of people with their MLOps pipelines also use, um, also store their models in a model repository, right? Or model store. And what I've found to be useful is to split your Docker, excuse me, your Docker file into a two-stage process. In the download stage, you will, um, for example, use MLflow uh, where your model is stored and you will download that model into the 
container being built over here in the downward stage. And in the production stage, which we saw uh, in the previous Docker file, what we'll change instead is instead of downloading it from having face, we will copy the model and the requirements from the download stage into the production stage. Um, this kind of a two-stage strategy is also used for uh, when you're building front-end apps or when you're building Java uh, apps, but it, it also helps you uh, build and containerize your models. Um, one important point, never put passwords or access tokens inside this. You can use something called args to, to do it. So this I found to be super interesting uh, way of getting the model inside the container. So I'll take a pause here which, which just and summarize what we've just seen. So there are three ways to build your own containers. One is you serve your model with an HTTP endpoint. The second one is you serve your model as a message queue. And third is you serve your model as a batch processing. You use, I prefer that you use that that we use uh, HTTP endpoint if a user uh, is waiting on the model prediction right away. If you can allow for some delay for the uh, model to predict stuff, um, you can use a message queue if there is an event-based mechanism you have that can handle it. And this allows for uh, you to not use to, to, to just reduce your cost because you don't need as many resources or you can time them separately or, or spread them out. The third one is batch processing, which you, you, you should use if you need to act on a large amount of data in a, in a scheduled fashion, so say nightly or something. Containers-wise, the core of the uh, container is the program, uh, the, the main class which has it, but then for each of the three ways, you have some additional files that help you package it together and then finally, you create the Docker file, which which creates your container and pushes it to repo. Awesome. We're now going to be changing gears, uh, gears and see what continuous integration looks like. So, what is exactly this whole CI/CD thing we heard of? And I, uh, some of you might already be aware of this, so I apologize if this is redundant. Um, in order to increase the velocity of how you deliver software, the software engineering community has come up with ways in which you don't have release cycles of like long, like one month long release cycles. Instead, what's emerged as a best practice is to allow people to perform continuous integration of their code and then continuously deliver that service into production. Um, we're going to be using a newer variant of a newer way of doing CICD called GitOps, which has been uh, widely used in the Kubernetes community, or at least people who are deploying apps on Kubernetes. There are other ways to do it, but I think for, for the purposes of this talk, um, this is a straightforward way in which when you decide that you want to either bring your own container or you want to use um, you know, third-party tools like PetroML, KSERV, and Selden and the likes, you can uh, perform CI CD in the same way. So the Containerization part is separate from the CI CD part. So let's look at how this works. The ML engineer, she comes in and see, she has the code, which we just saw, the whole container code, and that's pushed into GitHub or any Git repo. Uh, obviously, GitLab uh, and other vendors exist. Um, and you have your model, which might be stored in the model store from your data scientist, right? And so the first step is when you do this Git commit, um, CI processes like GitHub Actions or Circle CI or um, GitLab has its own way of doing things will run a process that can help you build the container. So they will just run the Docker file for you and build the container using the instructions we have in the Docker file and then push that repo, uh, the container, inside a container registry or the repo for that container. So that's the step one, which is from the code or the model, anytime a new code or new model becomes available using a pull request, it automatically gets containerized and it automatically gets pushed into the repo. So that makes these steps over here on the right-hand side very automated. The second step is the continuous delivery step, which we will talk in a bit, but that helps you actually deploy this container that you've just created onto Kubernetes. So I'll, I'll talk that, about that in a bit. So the first step, um, that you need for your continuous uh, integration is to have some sort of a script that just helps um, the CI tools find what to do. And 
I've preferred Docker Compose, um, learned it from um, some of the best people I've worked with in, in my previous companies, um, where you have this Docker Compose file can be used both for development locally on your machine, as well as have a test target, which the CI and software will use. One advantage of using Docker Compose is, let's say your model depends on uh, the a database, or your model depends on some config file in S3, right? And you need to load that somehow. So specifying in Docker Compose all the temporary services that your model de depends on, loading those up and et cetera, creates a very complete uh, package of your uh, model service only for the purposes of uh, for for testing and for the CI. Obviously, Docker Swarm is a way to deploy models and Docker Compose is used there somehow, but I'd, I'd say that in my experience, I prefer to use Docker Compose for developing locally and for running my, C, uh, for running my CI processes. Here you can see we have a service target which spins up the container and serves it as a local host. And that's how I use to test out whether what I've coded locally works or not. The second thing you need is um, to specify what happens on a pull request. So what we're going to say is create a file in the GitHub dot uh, GitHub folder, which says do this on a pull request. So if there's a pull request on the branch main, um, this defines what you need to do. And here what we are saying is check out the code from the repo. So it'll download the code from GitHub, GitHub uh, on that particular pull request, and then rest run the tests inside the container for that particular branch. So this is just specifying like, great, this is how you run that CI process as step. What this allows you to do is add some, uh, so in addition to this, you need to add some branch protection rules, which which mention like, hey, when somebody is doing P, uh, pull, re uh, pull request for your uh, repo for uh, CI CD, uh, make sure that there is a pull request uh, before merging it to main. This is just the best practice that I'm sure you're already using. Both of these combined together um, allow you to add these kind of checks, which make sure that your model's uh, services are delivered in a very um, uh, mindful way or in a way that is very well thought out and doesn't break production. I think nobody wants to be woken up in the middle of the night saying your model is crashing and things like that. So add these tests so that your team members can review your models going out. So the first check it does when you create a pull request is uh, it checks, uh, it, it, it needs at least one review from your team. The second one is this GitHub check that we just created is uh, built out. And so once both of these tests pass, you will get a green check mark over here, which you can merge your uh, branch domain. And in GitHub, the action looks like this, which is it is just doing the same thing you mentioned in your Docker file. It is executing all those steps running those lints, passing it, and the moment that everything is passed, great, you're, you get that green check mark. So in that way, you can, uh, once you get the green check mark, you can, you can merge your model. So from your, uh, in, in your repo, which has information on how do you, uh, once your container is created, uh, I'm sorry, when, when, once it's merged to main, we need to actually push it into the, uh, get uh, into a container registry. I'm using AWS here. Um, you can use Docker, whatever you want. Um, but essentially, the best practices here are make sure that there's tag immutability so that people have to add a tag to your container every time there's a new version. This just prevents people from accidentally uh, launching an older uh, version in, into production uh, with the same tag. The other best practice here is to ta uh, is to search for container vulnerability errors, and that helps you ensure that your product is more secure. So create your repo, and then provide access so that your GitHub can actually push uh, data to uh, push the container to this repo. So we saw one script in this action, which bit on on PR makes sure that the container is working. The second one is that we're going to push it to the actual registry. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. So this is the second one, which is on once the PR is approved and it is merged to main, we will build the container and push it. So this is under your .github folder um, under build and push main. So on merge to main, you check out the code, 
you configure for your credentials for your um, container repository. Uh, you authenticate into it. You create a short git commit hash and you build the container and push it with that short hash. Now, why do I prefer doing uh, tagging the repo with the, the image as git hash? It's because then you can connect like this model uh, or this code and this model that exists in this git repo, whatever hash it is, you know that this container contains that code. So if you, for example, start using versions, right? 0 0.1, 0 0.2, somebody or the other is going to accidentally step and release the same version uh, again. And that might somehow um, affect what's actually running in pr production. So from a best practices perspective, there should be tag immutability and Git hash allows you to connect the code with the connect uh, with the container. I found that this, this works really well. Hey dude, I got yeah. a question coming through here in the chat that yes. I thought was worth um, asking. I know yeah. it's been, it's been a minute since you were talking about it, but in <laughs> action with yes. any constraints that you know of, like CPU or memory, any of that. Um, so in this code, for example, I've been building CPUs. They have GPU runners available, or you can com uh, you can point any of these, so CircleCI, uh, Git, or GitHub, or GitLab to your own runners, and you can host those runners with whatever memory constraints you want. So, so they provide ways in which you can build it with any any uh, virtual machine you need. Awesome, awesome. All right, I'll let you get back to it. Thank, Thank you. Man. Thanks, and I'm I'm glad to also know that somebody's actually listening to this because when I'm on my slides, it's hard to figure out what's going on. There's yeah, and there's a few people that are asking for the slides. And I told them that I would email them to them um, afterwards in the newsletter. Sure, I, I will. I will. I will uh, touch on that at the end. Perfect. All right. Uh, talk to you later. Awesome. So, the way this particular action works is on merge to main. You check out the code, configure credentials, um, get get uh, actions, runs all of these steps, builds and pushes the container to the repo, and so now you're con you're um, model that we programmed with in any of the three ways is containerized and ready to push into your Kubernetes or production. So, and just to be safe, you can confirm that this tag was the same tag uh, of the git commit has, just to make sure everything's fine. You'll see that there are some critical errors that need to be vulnerabilities that need to be uh, uh, resolved. For the most part, I'd say that you can add other layers of security to minimize the effect of this. But what the best practice is, especially if you're deploying into an air-gapped environment or uh, let's say a financial institution or a healthcare institution where security is not just super important, but it's also regulatory uh, needed, is that you fix these vulnerabilities by pinning your packages, by updating your base Docker images and so on. So these things this become super helpful. To, to ensure that your uh, server is secure. Awesome. So we're going to talk about continuous delivery, um, and maybe I'll, I'll I'll use five minutes for this, but um, the second part is once your model has been containerized and pushed into the repo, you want to deploy it to Kubernetes. So we will have a different repo which only has how your Kubernetes app is deployed. The moment you change the app definition, You'll use uh, in, into GitHub, a tool like Argo CD or Flux can be used to deploy it directly onto Kubernetes. So it takes care of managing the delivery side of things, which is how do you deploy it to Kubernetes fast? And so for a way for the way one, which is HTTP endpoint, um, you can create a native Kubernetes operator like deployment. You specify what is the container image you need. You specify what are your resources needed. So if you need GPU, you can specify that over here. You specify what is the health check, which allows Kubernetes to ensure that this service is running stable. And then you have a service definition, which specifies and connects the deployments. If you want your model to be uh, exposed externally, you can use an ingress with some authentication. Obviously, you should never have an ingress without authentication. But for most part, a backend service is going to call your model. 
So you don't really need an ingress, which, which, which lets you do it. So the service and the deployment should be fine for deploying V1. For V2, you don't need the service part. You just need the deployment uh, 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 operator and you specify it the, uh, the container that you want to deploy. And the command is now different. Previously, it was start, uh, it was serve. Now we have the command start MQ. So it's the same container, it's just a different process that starts and, and serves it on the message queue. You might want to provide the, the input queue and output queue as environment variables. The last one for the way three is batch processing where uh, cron job works or job works um, as, a, as a Kubernetes operator. You can add the schedule to a cron job. And again, the container is the same. What changes is what, pro what is the command that you want to launch it with. So those were three ways to do it. And when you put this in your repo, you can have something like Argo CD that is installed in your Kubernetes cluster to auto deploy it to um, Kubernetes. The way you do it is you set up Argo CD or Flux, whatever you choose, with the name of your application, which um, uh, you create your application. You specify where is the Git repo uh, and what is the branch on the Git repo that you want to deploy this with. And Argo CD looks at your YAML files, looks at the cluster, and tells you whether your cluster is out of sync. And if it is out of sync, you can hit synchronize and run it. Um, and so you can see this in Argo CD works really well from a uh, continuous deployment perspective, wherein or delivery perspective, wherein it plans out what changes need to be made to your Kubernetes cluster and synchronize it automatically. I found it super helpful to deploy AI Hero. Um, and then one last thing on the CD side is uh, you can have these, uh, you can use something like customize to manage different deployment environments. You should never just use one code base, uh, oh, I'm sorry, one, one environment. You should have a dev environment or a staging environment or a production environment. And um, something like customize can be used to overwrite a base deployment. So let's say in the base deployment, we use the tag latest, but in, in, in staging, we, we want a specific version of the container to be deployed in the production, we want another well-tested, uh, well-scaling uh, model to be deployed. And so you pin the git commit hash of the tag that we are using over here and deploy it to production. The last thing you'll need in, in Kubernetes is uh, observability. And so this is obviously you have tools for ML observability. This is for Kubernetes cluster observability. Uh, New Relic uh, provides a really good way and there are other tools out there, so please do check other tools out, which 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 have some observability on top of Kubernetes. I apologize, that was a lot of code and a lot of information, um, but I, I wanted to give you an overview and demystify what all is needed to 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 serve stuff up on Kubernetes. Um, feel free to rewatch this and and go through it at your own pace when 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 Dimitrios pushes it out. Uh, with that being said, just a couple a few slides about how AI Hero is has benefited from um, Kubernetes. So. AI Hero helps fix bad data, um, and it allows you to do this with the help of a spreadsheet-like interface. So you have a spreadsheet-like interface that looks something like this on top of your data, um, where each column is powered by a machine learning model. So when you have some column, let's say email addresses, and you specify in settings that this is an email addresses, email address, we will run some tests for you. We will check what if this is a valid email address, we will check if it resolves, if it is uh, d deliverable, and so on. Phone numbers. This one I just entered in phone number, random phone number, which is uh, which was unformatted. And AI Hero then looked at it and said, "Hey, we can do this better and format it for you." This location, if you read this uh, out, what what I entered was two hundred one Spear Street, SF, and AI Hero um, cleaned this up for me automatically yeah, and also ran some tests. And lastly, AI Hero, like I said, has models powering each, uh, each column. So when you have, like, let's say, a profile picture, we will use a face, record, face detection model to see, confirm that there is a face in there and, and provide some additional checks. So to do this, we use Kubernetes, and I'll, I'll talk about it in a bit. But an additional um, advantage of doing it this way is that you can do machine learning uh, and annotations within our spreadsheet. So with AI Hero spreadsheets, um, you know, for some 
text um, categorization tasks. These are tweets and you want to tag them as disaster or not disaster. You can tag them right here and we can um, also predict uh, and build the model on this particular column automatically for you. The way we do this is through uh, workers. The, I mentioned the way to uh, of how you deploy models. So we are deploying those services in the same way through our events, event queue. And then we also have a models library which are powering all these columns. So uh, AI Hero is able to help our customers with, with uh, machine learning models powering data cleanup. And um, that's it. So thank you for listening. I hope I hope this was informative. And again, you know, hopefully once this gets out, you have enough time to go through these again. Do check us out at AI Hero Studio if you think a spreadsheet-like interface on top of your data can help you move faster. The models are behind a feature flag right now, so do connect with me if you really want to use those models and train machine learning models within AI Hero. Um, this is the link to the slides. Uh, Demetrius, I, uh, I think if people use the QR code or go to that, go to the slide. Uh, I'm really curious uh, because I'm sharing all this uh, content. I, I'm curious on how people are approaching Kubernetes. So if you could please answer a few questions before um, with this uh, with this form, I will send you the slides immediately. Um, and the code that I just presented and all the uh, description of it in a written format is also available on my medium. So you can look at the articles I've published over the last uh, few months that talk about how do you containerize with Falcon, how do you containerize it in three ways, uh, CI and CD with uh, with uh, Kubernetes. Another quick shout out. Uh, tomorrow, obviously, you have the big large language models uh, conference, which Demetrius just mentioned. But in if you are in SF, um, I'm going to be there. Uh, there's a community meetup that we are helping that I'm helping organize. You have creator of fast API, creator of Langchain, and creator of feature form all speaking at the event. It's going to be super cool. So if you haven't registered, do do that already. Huge. And that's sorry, what's up? No, I was just going to say huge, huge lineup. Yeah, excited, excited to to attend that as well as to host you guys and and help you uh, and connect with you. Um, and then monthly, I I casually. In my personal capacity, organize a ML Hops happy hour. Uh, do do connect with that. I I definitely do want to give a shout out to everybody who's been helping me on my Kubernetes journey. Sri at Metaflow, Shankar, a really good friend uh, on the personal side, but he's been helping me uh, on some of these Kubernetes concepts. Hamza uh, at at Simplified has 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 guided me recently on KServe and what uh, other amazing tools are out there. And um, I would be remiss to say. Um, folks at this community I'm part of called Tribot AI um, has helped me grow a lot with, with all I do with ML. Uh, and so shout out to the folks all over there for all their support. There's a good question that came through from David. And he's asking, you know, it wasn't entirely clear to me why Docker Compose was needed. Can you explain that again in a few words? Yeah. So previously, um, in some of the models that we've had, we've had to um, you use some extra services like a database and so on. And so when you start your tests inside a CI process, it doesn't have, like just starting that that server by itself uh, is not going to cut it. You also need a MongoDB to back it, for example. Um, let's say you have Redis queues. You start your server a Redis queue is not available to it, so it'll crash, which is why within Dockerfile, you can add the Redis uh, container as well. And that helps you completely package an application for test purposes when it comes up. And so it's just a way to, uh, if your server, um, if your model server is dependent on other services like queues, databases, and so on, you can package them all together so that your done tests run correctly. And there was one question that was just asking about which books or sources do you advise for learning about MLOps? Are there anything? I mean, Chris was awesome in the chat. He also mentioned a, a few cool things, but yeah. do you have any that you like to do? I have a few that I could spout out, but what well, do you look? I was going to say the community is the best place to get these <laughs> answers because uh, I've learned a lot from the MLOps community. And this is my way of just sharing uh, back to the community. 
I think that we have a lot of experts in the community who help answer these questions and will guide you with resources. To be honest, some of the best resources are not books because some of these books are outdated uh, in, in a year or two. Some of the best um, resources are blogs and people who are contributing with open source stuff. So for example, um, the code that I just presented is also open source and made public by me um, in, in if it, LinkedIn through the Medium article. So do, do go check that out. Yeah, I was going to say my favorite blogs, I think the DoorDash blog is really strong. I see there's somebody in here from Newbank. Newbank has got a killer blog when it comes to machine learning. So check out their blog. Airbnb is always great with especially like data engineering and all that good stuff. Lyft has got an awesome blog for engineering. Uh, Netflix, obviously, Facebook, like the Ubers, the Netflix, the Facebooks, that that kind of stuff. The ones that it I think is also another like hidden gem is the Instacart blog is really good too. So those are like my favorite, I think, engineering blogs. What are your favorite engineering blogs? I so I, I I read the con like I, I think another thing that has helped me I've done the blogs obviously um uh, and, and, and I'm sharing the community the blogs that I'm reading. But another thing I want to give a shout out to is the communities uh, themselves from the two vendors. They will help you figure it out and somebody in that community will help you figure it out. So yeah. don't go thinking like, hey, there's absolutely no resources available. If you ask politely, uh, please and thank you. Somebody's going to help you out because everybody's passionate about sharing their knowledge and everybody's passionate about learning. So um, yeah. I, I found, I've never found like somebody's not sharing that information. Everybody's happy to uh, help you learn and grow. That's so true. That is so true. So, um, I mean, I think that's it. I've got one last thing to, to drop into the uh, into the chat before we go because I know that everybody is very excited for the event tomorrow. In case you are not signed up, which I'm hoping that everyone is signed up already. Uh, Please sign up for that. And if you would like to check out one of those shirts that I threw up on the screen earlier, then that is where you can get it. You can go ahead and buy it. Or you may get lucky and just win it tomorrow at the event. Uh, <laughs> I'm not promising anything, but it could happen. So in case you want a shirt that says that you hallucinate more than chat GPT, Something. You got to come and be active in the chat tomorrow at the event. And that's it. I mean, we have a podcast in the MLOps community where we talk to great people like Raul all the time. Weekly goes out. We've also got a newsletter that I encourage you to check out if you're not already subscribed. And we'll throw the good old slides in that too. And then, last but not least, if you're not in Slack, join Slack. It is a pleasure to chat with everyone in there. So... Awesome. There we go. Thanks, Demetrius, for having me. Everybody, I, I apologize that there was maybe too much information, but feel free to reach out and I'm happy to help. There we that's it, dude. It's um uh, it's great. I think that it's better to go with too much information and let people follow up with you on the questions later. I, I totally agree. Yeah. Dude. So it's been a pleasure, man. I'm so thankful that you came on here and did this and that you are in SF. So anybody that's in SF, go and meet Raul in person in the after party tomorrow and or the ML Hops events, which we are happy to make happen too. That's so cool. All right, man. I'll talk to you later. I'll see you tomorrow. Have a nice one, guys. Bye. See you all. Bye.